Hello again! Welcome back! Good to see y'all. As usual, this is Becca going by Nightcat or Nightcat's Meow most places online. And I am back from Balticon, ready to talk to you again about Linden scripting language. Alright, so we pretty much wrapped up the work with the detector last time. There's a few kinks to it I probably should still poke at, but... I'd need a lot more sim traffic and a couple other things in my favor to do those well. So hopefully you haven't had any trouble with it. If any of you have, just go ahead and let me know and I will try to work that out. Um, but this week we begin a series based on a request on my Discord by Stefan. Thank you for speaking up on there. Stefan was concerned about handling multiple events within a timer. And he specified this as something that was supposed to have a slow color change to it, as well as a pulsing glow. And I've actually had to deal with something like that a few times. There are definitely ways to have multiple events within a single timer. The trick is the timer, you just use as a clock tick, and then you track the individual events separately. So we're going to start with just making it shift between two different colors and from high to low glow on a timer and then we'll go through and look into other ways it can be upgraded from there. So, as is so often the case, we will start with our dear friend, the Mark One Cube. I'm trying to adjust this around so I can actually keep the cube in frame. You know what? For something like this, we'll make it a sphere. We'll make it a ball instead of a cube. I'm trying to figure out likely where I'm going to be positioning the script window so I can try to keep that ball in frame at the same time as I expand the script window for you. All right, just because you want to be able to play around with this, I'm actually going to set a couple of variables. We're going to start with vector color one equals, we'll keep that one simple. We'll start with a straight white vector color two. Actually, you know what? Straight white would be kind of dull. Let's do pure red and shift to pure blue. If people do, have not seen before or dealt with this before, color in LSL, again, is handled as a, what's going on here? Ah, just a hello avatar. Um, a series of vectors. Basically, you can consider these, they're the basic RGB value, red, green, blue. And they will go from 0 to 1. You can think of it as from 0% to 100% because it will take floats. So you could do, for example, 0 0.5 for 50%, 0 0.95, however you wanted to figure that. This isn't quite as simple as what you may be used to from web design. Well, actually it is simpler, but it's not the same as what you may be used to from web design with uh, hex code values. Um, just to briefly explain for anybody who doesn't know what a hex value is, I'm sure a lot of you will, but for the ones that don't, a hex code is short for hexadecimal code. Um, and hexadecimal is actually pretty interesting. Instead of a z uh, zero to nine as a single digit, it goes 0 to 9, then A, B, C, D, E, and F, because it can have 16 possible values in a single place. And that evolved out of trying to make shorthand for binary. It's meant as a way to be able to represent a, uh, a chunk of binary in a single character. So... If I remember correctly, it is two characters in hex code represents a single 8-bit uh, byte. Um, 
And there you go. For anyone who wonder what all the you know, terabyte, megabyte, all that other stuff is, what that, that byte thing is all about, a byte is eight bits. A bit is an individual one or zero. And, you know, kind of cutely, four bits, which is half a byte, is actually called a nibble. I am not even making that up. Um, then we're going to go to float. Flow one equals. We're using float on this because we want to have the option of being able to set this to mid range values. If you don't want it to go all the way to bright, to its maximum bright, or all the way to its minimum bright, this is just a, a way to, to control that. So, what we're going to want for a state entry, just to start it, set timer event. If you put it at a very low number, then actually we'll... I'll make this even easier, put it in terms many non-programmers are familiar with. Um, integer FPS equals So, we're setting the timer event to 1 divided by FPS, which is frames per second. So, that just gives you it. And if you're going to animate something, the fewer frames per second, or the more frames per second, the smoother it looks. So, this is just a way that most people will be familiar with in order to adjust that number. So, it's 1 second divided by the number of frames. Simple enough. We're not going to need a touch start for this part of things. So we're, we're down to timer. All right, another thing we're going to want to do, we're going to need to know which direction either of these are going. So we're going to need a toggle. So integer. That would be glow. And... For a simple version, a integer on color will work. We'll expand on that later. That just lines that up pretty. That's all that is. We're also going to need to know where in the cycle it is for any given one. So we're going to need a vector that will hold the transformation or the permutation that we're on. So color now. And glow now. All right. So we have the two colors we'll be shifting between in this early prototype. What color will be on now? the two levels of glow we're shifting between, and where it is at any given time, and how many frames per second it's going to be. And these are going to simply be a way of tracking whether it's going up or down between the different states. So we're going to start by putting in the glow. So at state entry, glow now equals 0.0. .0. Here we're going to calculate float glow shift. We can even change that better. Um, dimmer equals. Sorry for the slight hiccup there. So float dimmer equals, and this is how much you're going to change the amount of glow each iteration. So right now we're talking about 30 times in a second. So let us say 
zero point zero one. There we go. And actually, that means we could put that up here in the globals. Make it easier to find all of those. So, if glow now, else, these are your two states for tracking your glow. If it is on now, then you're rising. If it is false, you're getting dimmer. So what we will do is correction. Glow now was the placeholder. I was being an idiot. Glow now equals glow now plus dimmer if glow now I'm sorry if yes if glow now equals glow one glow one then we're gonna make that even easier is equal to or greater than glow one just in case somehow it goes over glow equals false that will flip the switch and now you'll start getting dimmer instead then you're going to need the actual control code for manipulating glow which is in set primitive parameters. Come on. Come on. Pop over. There we go. actually use fast on this one. Here it is. Remembering all of the arguments for set primitive parameters is a bit of a bear. That's why I always just copy them off the wiki. Whoops. I copied the wrong one. That would be great if I wanted to make this thing spin. With a nice client-side operation. Remind me one of these days to discuss client versus server-side operations. Actually, a thing you could do to simplify this code even farther you can copy that out of there you could put that at the end here or at the beginning in either case if you're putting it at the beginning then it is going to be one cycle behind admittedly However, what's going to happen is that whatever glow now was set to, we're setting it to a default of 0, 0, which is off. It will automatically set that to at the beginning, and these will just determine what it's supposed to be set to on its next cycle through. You could stick it inside the ifs, but 
you don't really need to. It's not a thing you're really going to see that much of a difference to if you put it in versus out. We'll change that to minus dimmer and less than or equal to glow 2. Changes glow to true. So, going through this, you may even want to consider changing it from glow 1 to glow high and glow 2 to glow low, just to make it easier to remember which one you're dealing with. Because one will be the high point, one will be your low point. And this should automatically cycle and flip from one to the other. So let's give that a test, shall we? We have a small problem. It says that name not defined within scope, and I see why. I did not capitalize the N in now, so we're actually going to get the same problem down here. Unless I change all of these. Silly coder kitty. No catnip for thee. Easier to change it one time because I did everything else one capital letter. <sighs> Getting all your capitalization correct. Functions call mismatch type or number of arguments. Up oh, there we go. The link primitive parameters. <sighs> that was a mistake on my part. I'm so used to using set link primitive parameters fast. All right. Now that appears to not function. look at it. Probably going to confirm that I did something wrong. That glow is definitely not changing. So, let's figure out why. This is where the debug feedback comes in. What stupid move did I make? The better you get at code, the more you got to accept sometimes you're an idiot. <laughs> Okay, that is part of the problem right there. Setting it up that way did not work the way I thought it would work. It shows that it will go off every absolutely zero seconds. So, I thought we could do a practical adjustment there. I was evidently wrong. So we're going to set that to a tenth of a second and see if that solves our problem. I'm sorry, a hundredth of a second. And bound state error. Okay, that tells us two things. One, we solved the problem number one. Also, that's probably And second, since it came outside of its permissible range, 
causing that error. There it goes again. You can see here the amount of glow by the number is actually rising and falling. It's dropping right now. If you watch the ball in the corner there, you can see it slowly getting less and less aggressively glowy. We should get a bounce state error here again in a moment. Yep, got the error. And now it's rising back up. So it tells us that that part is working. There is just a problem that it is exceeding its permitted range a little bit. So that just means that I'm allowing it to calculate one point outside of its range. There are a couple ways you can solve that. The easiest is to change this like so. Now one point outside of their range is still within the SL permitted range. Negative point zero one is not. All right. That solved the problem, but there is a better way to solve it, or I should say a more thorough way to solve it. A way to solve it that is applicable to a wider range of possible problems. And that is to create a catch. You want to go ahead and confirm that what you're asking it to do is permissible inside the... I could didn't look like it was getting dimmer, so I was double tracking. Um, to make sure that whatever you're, you're telling it to do is within the permitted parameters. So, to do that, we'll set an if glow now is less than zero, glow now equals zero. Else if glow now is greater than one, glow now equals one. This is a better way to do it. The first way merely goes through and catches the mechanical problem I created. The error caused by allowing the math to go above or below the given threshold. This version actively catches if that happens and reverts it to something within permissible boundaries, which means I can take those back to there and we still aren't going to have an issue. See, no error that time. We'll go ahead and watch it climb up and then back down over a few seconds then I will throw in the calculations to shift the color. Next week when we come back, I can go ahead and show you how to set these to use different colors or even randomized colors and possibly randomized glows as well. And that will all still be contained within the same timer event that we're currently operating with now. So. And again, the, the one adjusting the, the limits to where, because the math allowed it to go count up one more past its limit, you can change the limits so that that's okay, or you can create a catch. On some more advanced programming languages, they call that a trap call, where it will actually catch the error and automatically resolve that. All right, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and sorry for the bit of a pause there and welcome back, cat. I um, guess I owe you all another picture of my cat. She's interrupting video again. <sighs> Thought I was done with her when I paused it a minute ago. Pause my recording. But precious interruptus is a very real thing around here. Um, so anyway, where was I? Oh, yes, colors. In order to shift the colors, you have to determine 
the difference between the color one and the color two, and then how to go through and alter between each of them. And that's going to involve a little more of a complicated mathematics because I can set up a very simple example this time because we know exactly what the difference is. But it's another thing to deal with in future weeks is to look at calculating the steps between them. So we are going to color red color blue I should have really thought about the, the difficulty of dealing with color stuff. I have actually tried to do color calculations in here before. You trust me, you're asking for a pain in the rear, but I will work on figuring out a simplified way of doing it dynamically by next week for y'all. Uh, I've, I've tried a few other ways in the past, and none of them were simple. I'm going to try to make a simple way for you come tomorrow, uh, come next week. So, if we're shifting towards red, then each stage, what we're going to do is look at... You have the RGB value, which is going to be as an X, Y, Z. So, integer X equals color now dot X. We're only in this instance dealing with two different ones. We're just using this as a tracker. Um, again, as I say, I'm going to come up with a better one for you all for next week, but this will do well enough now to show how to divide the different functions within a specific timer event. So I'm putting these in a separate call up here because it's going to be slightly more complicated than the two lines of code that go in each of them down there. So integer x color now. We're actually going to say if x is this would be going up on the x so it's going from the blue to the red so we're going to assume this one starts at zero so if x is greater than or equal to one color equals false. And the other thing we're going to do is we're just going to simply say color now equals color now plus zero point zero this specifically puts it on a different rate than the other one, just so that it... We'll even make it three. A different rate from the other one, just so that it best shows off the... Uh, how this will handle different operations within the same thing. We're adding a vector to a vector, so we'll just add each of the three pieces distinctly. So this will increase the first one by 0 0.03 and decrease the other one by 0 0.03. And actually, perhaps a better way to do that, definitely a better way to do that, would be to do integer z equals color now dot z 
because this way we can deal with each of them individually so that we can put the proper checks on if the number goes too high or too low. So, x equals x plus 0 0.03. y, I'm sorry, z equals z minus 0 0.03 if x, since we're adding on x, is greater than 1, x equals 1 if z is less than zero, c equals zero. Color now equals x comma zero comma z. So what we just did here is we extracted the first number and the last number out of the vector that is color now. In this case, the red and the blue because we're not changing green. Next week when I go through we can worry about green as well. I'm going to be doing a much more complicated algorithm for color work on next week's. So if x is greater than or equal to 1, color is false. That turns off the climbing and will begin the descending. It will add 0 0.03 to the x, or the red coordinate. If it's greater than 1, it will change that to... And you know what? We could even take that out. If you really wanted to streamline this, we could make that part of this statement. But we'll go ahead and leave it as is for now. We'll worry about streamlining later. Then you subtract the same amount from z, which is the blue coordinate for RGB. If blue has dropped below 0, then blue equals 0. And then color now plugs those back in. So we're going to copy that into here. And we're going to change this to now we'll flip it to start climbing the other direction. And we just change these operations. To their opposites. We can save that. Somehow, somehow I have managed, I think that was when my cat walked across the keyboard that it managed to erase that, so putting this back in, growl. Bad kitty. That was... Hadn't I fixed that somewhere else? Evidently undoing some feline intervention. Undid the fixing the case sensitivity on color now. That's a little bit annoying. And that was forgetting that that has to be capitalized. Type mismatch. Ah. 
that was an error on my part. It has to be a float, which stands for floating point, because you can have a long string of stuff past the decimal point, which is a different numeric category. That was me being dumb. There we go. Now all that saves. So, to go back down into here, if color I do not know why I keep getting random R's. I gotta figure out what on my rig is doing that. I thought it was my cat, but she's not over here right now. And we should probably set color now. So now we have a beginning point for color now. In order to see if that's actually tr the color is actually triggering, we are going to temporarily disable the glow. And it appears I've done something wrong with that, so let's figure out why. I see it right now. I see the exact problem right now. Okay, there is something triggering that key. Might be my Razor Tartarus. You see in my chat bar, there's the R's going. The reason it's not triggering is because I hadn't set it to set the color now. The way I did with the glow. So, set color. I believe that that is a all sides thing. Just double checking. This is one of my more rambling videos, people. Those who are uh, happy to have the very off the cuff extemporaneous version should be very pleased with this. There we go. That is the correct syntax for that. That was really silly of me to forget that. There you go. re-enable the uh, change to the glow. Now you're pulsing your glow and your coloration at two completely different rates, both handled through the same timer event. Yep, your glow is fading, it's just doing it slower than the color is pulsing. And of course you can change the rates of either of 
any of these however you want to. So hopefully that gives an adequate example of how to use Fulbright to keep the shadows from being a distraction. Hopefully this gives you an adequate example of how to use different measures in order to determine and toggle switches in order to control different sets of behavior using the same timer event. In this case, what you're doing is you're using the timer event merely as a clock tick, and you're allowing the measured result in each case, the glow or the color, to control when they change. And you can, of course, play around with the paces of either all that you want to. So next week, I'll go into a bit of a better algorithm for the color shift, algorithm just being a, a method or a set of instructions for it and see if I can't clean up some of this a little bit, make it a little easier to work with. Uh, hopefully this uh, hopefully this answers your questions well enough, Stefan, um, and hopefully you'll be interested in sticking around through the next couple of weeks as I go through more of the nitty-gritty detail. In the meantime, to all of you, thanks for coming back. Again, sorry for missing last week, but I was out of town. But I'm back, I'm ready to rock, roll, and make videos. So please, uh, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Tell your friends. Sign up for the Discord, link as usual in the description. Videos are usually live Tuesdays by noon Eastern Standard Time, unless something gets in the way of it. And usually I put up something talking about it. The reason I didn't have one of those this last week is I told you all about it beforehand, though it occurs to me I probably should have scheduled one just announcing it again. I will be doing that next time I'm out of town. I really should have thought that through better. Um, so I suppose that's it for now. So good day, good week, good luck, happy coding. Meow. Meow meow. Meow meow meow.